Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you all for coming to this program uh, on the psychological impact of displacements. When I spoke to Ravi, who I'm uh, sort of standing in for because he's traveling, uh, and we talked about reviewing this book, he said, uh, let's make the dialogue a little more wider, and let's talk about displacements in general and what it does to people uh, in our situation here psychologically. I guess that's because uh, many of the people who are going to present today are from the mental health field. So whether you're talking about the Holocaust or whether you're talking about Bosnia or uh, Croatia or whether you're talking about Bangladesh and uh, East Pakistan or whether you're talking about in recent times uh, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, we're always talking about displacements and what it can do to people, individuals, and families. And so we're using the, this book as a, as, a, as a medium, as it were, to talk about displacements and what it does to people. So uh, let me call on the uh, two people who edited this book to come up and occupy their places here. Um, very good friends of mine for the last 30, 40 years, Dr. Sanjeev Jain and Dr. Alok Sarin. Uh, Sanjeev is a professor of, senior professor of psychiatry at Nimhans. And in addition to doing psychiatry and mental health, he's had an enduring um, interest in history of psychiatry and history in general, and uh, also uh, on another spectrum, molecular genetics. Uh, so, Sanjeev, uh, welcome and please come up and take your seat. <laughs> Sanjeev is a member of the BIC and I'm sure many of you would know him. But you may not know Alok Sarin. Alok Sarin? Uh, another old friend of mine from the 80s. Alok Sarin is a... He's a psychiatrist who works, who finished from the All India Institute of, I think both of you sit on one side. He finished from the All India Institute of Medical Science in Delhi and then he spent, had a small stint in um, Nimhans, Bangalore. And that's when uh, all of us became friends because we were all uh, senior residents and students together. Um, right now he works, he practices in Delhi and he is also, um, He's on the, he's a, he was a chairperson of the Richmond Fellowship Society, which is a voluntary organization looking at uh, homes for mentally ill. Uh, more importantly, he was uh, the person who started the Canvas SQ program in Delhi. And this is a program that's been running now for more than 10 years, Alok, which has looked at uh, various issues like the kind of issues that we've been doing here in the BIC. He has been a senior fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, the Teen Murthy House, and he was awarded the Fellowship for Research on Mental Health Aspects of Communal Conflict. And this is a dialogue that they've started a few years ago, and it's, as far as he's saying, it's, it's continuing. Um, he's also an adjunct faculty at the Banyan Academy of Leadership in Mental Health, and he's very much uh, involved in researching History of Psychiatry in India with special interest on the history of mental hospitals. So welcome, Alok, to BIC. Um, the third person uh, who I'll call on stage is uh, Dr. Pratima Murthy. She's a professor of psychiatry and he's, she's actually... <laughs> Sanjeev's and my head of department, actually. So welcome, madam. Uh, She's, um, she's also heads the Center for Addiction Medicine, and she's an alumnus of Bangalore Medical College, and also from uh, Diploma and MD from Nimhans. Um, she's a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Glasgow. And um, in addition to history of psychiatry, which Sanjeev and Alok have worked on together, uh, she's also been interested in the area of human rights with regard to mental health care, and she's uh, one of the sort of uh, prominent authors on the National Humans, Human Rights Commission report on mental health, 
for the NHRC and also for the Women's Commission on uh, the State of Women in Institutions. So welcome, Pratima. And to moderate this uh, discussion, I would like to call on stage Dr. Chiranjeev Singh. I think the reason Ravi asked uh, Chiranjeev to moderate this is because um, he was saying that uh, Mr. Singh was very much part of the partition. And I was talking to him today. He said that he remembers fleeing um, Pakistan to come to India at, the, at that time. And so an appropriate person really to talk uh, to moderate this session. Um, everybody knows Mr. Singh has been a, a long-time member of the BIC, He's the former ambassador of India to UNESCO in Paris. Uh, he has been in the IAS, a batch of 69. He retired in 2005 as the Developmental Commissioner of Karnataka and additional Chief Secretary to the Government of Karnataka. Uh, after his retirement, he has been associated with numerous NGOs working in the field of rural development, environment and culture. He was awarded the Rajotsava Award in 2005 by the government of Karnataka for his achievements. Welcome, sir. <laughs> so very quickly, the way we are going to do this today, and I will leave this to the moderators to uh, take it up forward, is that uh, Alok and Sanjeev will talk uh, briefly for about 10 minutes each about how they put together the book and the relevance in the current context and how each of the chapters uh, which were written and authored by other people were, how they chose those people. And Pratima, who's written the last chapter in the book, will actually give a capsule and an overview of the whole book and maybe a critique. And then, and then uh, Mr. Singh and Pratima would probably ask questions to the uh, two authors to moderate this. So we'll have about, a, about half an hour of these kind of presentations, and then you have almost an hour for discussions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Thank you, Matthew, for, for this, for arranging this, and to the BIC. So what I'll do in about seven, eight minutes is given ideas to the layout of the book, and then Alok will describe how the book came about in its uh, organic growth, so to speak. So, you know, and when we learn psychiatry, we are always talking about the, actually the outsider, the people with mental illness are commonly seen as the outsiders, and there's been a whole history of social science uh, for the last uh, 50 odd years trying to understand what is the response of society to madness in the current socio-political context? This has to a large extent also been guided by events in Europe and the way psychiatry and mental health care changed and transformed over the last 100, 200 years from asylums to communities to individualism to protection. And uh, the events and the politics of the West lie just under the surface of psychiatry itself. So when we were talking about, as, as practicing psychiatrists, when you talk about patients, when you see patients who've been upset by displacements, by violence, and then you realize that most of the social models are derived from the West, and we have not paid enough attention to the events happening, in a sense, under our noses. And then we go back into history and find that there's a complete silence about what happened in the 40s and 50s to the field of psychiatry, to the field of medical care, to the field of looking after the ill and the disabled and the injured, there's been no conscious attempt by the medical profession to understand the events that happened. Unlike Europe, where whether it's Nazi medicine or the Holocaust or the psychotherapies or the consequences of the Holocaust have been debated endlessly ad infinitum. So why was the silence there? So we try to understand that by by looking at it in a kind of sequential process, the book was initially to be titled The Madness of Partition and the Partitioning of Madness. Uh, the first one, the partitioning of madness for the very simple reason that Toba Tek Singh, which many of us would have read, uh, talks about the life of Toba Tek Singh in the Lahore Asylum, and that's, a, that's the apocryphal picture of the partition. We found during our research and, and various archives that the mental hospital is actually partitioned. The patients were divided on the basis of religion, 
Hindu Muslims were Hindu patients were sent to India, and some patients, Muslim patients, were picked up from all over India and sent to Pakistan. Now, this kind of partitioning of objects, buildings, paper, equipment is understandable. Partitioning humans was something unusual. So with that, we started our little hunt into what exactly went on, why did this ideology come up, what happened in the 10 years before. And what we found is that over the last, over the preceding 10 or 15 years, there had been a kind of psychological distancing which had been produced between the communities through the politics, through the machinations, through various processes that were going on. So much so that political commentators actually called it the political insanity of India, by Vakil. And uh, so there was a whole lot of give and take about how justified was this insane desire to separate, succeed, and be identified purely on communitarian aspects. So that's what we start in the first two, in the partitioning of madness, which, uh, which uh, Alok Sarin and Anirudh Kala collaborated on, on the partitioning of the Lahore Mental Hospitals and the building up of the Amritsar Delhi hospitals. Then one must also remember the 40s is when the health system was being, was being developed and partitioning the health or the events of the partition destroyed any notion we could have had of a unified healthcare system. At that time, England itself was building up its national health service and many of the countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand transitioned to a national health service, whereas countries which were ripped asunder by political strife like India, like South Asia and Nigeria were left with very poor medical services. And the political consequences of that poor health service are also quite apparent. Uh, then we, from there we shift on to the larger discourse of actually the work of how is this produced. So Moshumi Basu talks about how the language of the othering is a very constant feature in why partitioning is inevitable. Whether it's Yugoslavia, whether it's Darfur, whether it's Congo, the fact that people of a certain community are not valid human beings to share the same communal space, not even physically, but even the world of ideas is at its origin. Very often we start using the language of psychiatry and psychoanalysis to define the other, and that whole process of how we choose to demonize the other is as much a political process as it is a social psychological process. And very often countries have used this process very effectively. After all, one mustn't forget that Nazi Germany did to Jews, but after experimenting it on the ones with mental illness. The first people, the first victims of the gas chambers were people with mental illness on whom this technique was perfected and then applied to the other. So there's a whole process by which this occurs. Tarun Saint and uh, Hina Nandrajog focus entirely on the literature output of an, or the memorializing of this and its reflection in theater, poetry, and other social um, discourse in the 50s and 60s using, Tarun, in Tarun's case, material available mainly in English through translation, and in the case of Hina, main, mainly the Punjabi and the Hindi literature. Because after all, literature is one of the most effective ways of sharing our conscious experience. And how this conscious experience was reflected metaphorically, realistically, and politically and socially becomes a very important way to understand how we come to terms with it. Uh, then we talk about uh, Anjana Sharma and Gopa Savarwal, who talk about anger as a short madness, which is covering the last year, the one year preceding 15th August 1947, and the life of Gandhi and the press coverage of what was going on. And it's a very interesting account as to how the media at that time portrayed this. What comes up again and again is that everybody, almost everybody calls it a madness. Gandhi actually says that we have to be like the superintendents of mental hospitals who soothe people by their words, that India has become mad, it's like become like a huge mental hospital. And our work is to soothe the tempers down, just like the mental hospital doctors do. The first time I've heard anything complimentary said about mental hospitals by a politician, but that's aside. And uh, then Aisha Kidwai, uh, who translated her grandmother's book on the experience of working with the Muslim refugees in the Purana Kila area, Azadi Ki Chaume, gives a very moving account of the experiences of the partition, and then goes on to talk about the way in which women were objectified, commodified, exchanged, and branded and then exchanged it by a political process without any sense of personal autonomy or independence. So this gendering of violence, this gendering, the othering, the fact that certain human beings could be used as so-called collaterals, 
all this politics is something that continues to this date. And so, and so Keshi Kamra actually summarizes these viewpoints when she talks about how violence, how the rhetoric of violence has become valid political discourse now. So violence is about the only thing that justifies retributive violence is what is needed. And this, the idea that strong affects and damaging violence is a valid political tool, irrespective of the harm it does to individuals, is, has become the prevailing ethos in our modern society. Now, what were the implications of this? The implication, how did we do this research? We worked on archives. We didn't go to any personal accounts. We, what we wanted to look at was the systemic responses of the system, of how doctors were targeted, how hospitals were targeted, what records were kept in the hospitals. And uh, one of the most moving phrases that I, I particularly strikes uh, close to my heart is that of a doctor saying that you know, he's uh, tending to somebody who's been stabbed. And he says, I can heal, I can stitch the wound of the person who has been cut but the moral abyss in the hands of the perpetrator who wielded a knife to a fellow human being at close quarters, that abyss will take generations to heal. So that is the problem. Since we've never had any identification, we know we had a million and a half victims, but we cannot identify a single perpetrator, unlike other places in the world. We had millions of victims, no perpetrators. That moral abyss in the heart of the perpetrators has gone unanswered, unaddressed, undiscussed. And therefore, what, how do we overcome this historical baggage? In the clinic, where we see patients who still suffer from these kinds of horrific acts of violence based on identity, language, borders, whatever we do, who still face the same issues. And you know, how did, why do we need to understand this seminal, seminal incident of 70 years ago and see how it reflects in the little tragedies and not so little tragedies of our times. So that was the purpose of the book uh, when we, uh, as we started it and I've given you a brief uh, overview. So I'll give it over to Alok. Thanks, thanks Sanjeev. Um, <clears throat> thank you also to, to Matthew for organizing this. Thank you to the Bangalore International Center for uh, inviting us here for the book. Uh, so Sanjeev has told you a little bit about what the book is. Uh, no? OK. Uh, very often, people get disappointed by what the book is not. And very often, when people look at the book, what they are expecting to see is uh, oral histories. They're looking to see what what is the psychological impact of the partition of India? Uh, you know, the first, when the book was released, uh, a number of people called and uh, said, you know, we want to do uh, interviews and we want to uh, 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 ask uh, in Hindi, Ki is kitab ka nichod kya hai? You know, what is the gist of this book? And the fact is that there is no gist. I mean, there is no one gist in that sense. The book comes, uh, in a sense, from a place uh, of discomfiture. It comes from a place of uh, dissatisfaction. Sanjeev's parents, Sanjeev's family, as mine, uh, are refugees of uh, partition. We are psychiatrists. We've, we are psychiatrists. We are partition refugees. And one of the biggest silences, so I'm sure all of you have read uh, Urvashi Butalia's uh, wonderful book, which is called The Other Side of Silence, which is about the silences of partition, the silences that partition has evoked and how as a society, uh, we have been very uncomfortable in addressing any of those uh, silences. Within those multiple silences is the silence of psychiatry. So even if we accept the fact that, that there are multiple silences on the subject of partition, 
and it's all and there's a there's a there are obvious and clear and and multiple reasons you know everybody's victim everybody's perpetrator uh, the the respectable man across the street uh, has done some not so particularly nice things there are uh, there are horrible skeletons in in many cupboards and which is why it's been difficult to talk about uh, all of these things uh, uh, which surround the partition the what is particularly intriguing is that look i mean all every other discipline whether it's film whether it's music whether it's literature whether it is psychology they have actually addressed uh, at some level at least uh, the traumas of partition mainstream psychiatry has been totally totally silent on psychi on on partition and this given the fact that many of or at least a handful of our senior uh, psychiatrists who have been vocal and who have been who are widely widely read and write very widely uh, and have written about pretty much everything under the sun who have personally been through uh, the partition but there is nothing which talks about what psychiatry thinks about the partition so this is this is something which was in a sense hugely intriguing uh, for us and hugely dissatisfying for us and and clearly this is something that you know psychiatry is may, is should be looking at so at one level the book was an attempt to stimulate a discussion about this within psychiatry and at another level to stimulate a discussion in this in society and interestingly uh, the way that events have panned out today at least uh, in the early afternoon we had a discussion on the book uh, in the department of psychiatry at the national institute of mental health and neurosciences and lo and behold in the evening we are having a, a discussion at the bangalore international center so uh, at least some of those uh, intentions of of creating those uh, conversations are happening so the story starts actually about 10 or 12 years ago when uh, sanjeev and i went to a conference in uh, lahore uh, <clears throat> which was one of the first conferences that uh, psychiatry professionals between uh, of india and pakistan had uh, you know uh, uh, to talk to each other in a sort of a formal uh, setting and they they obviously wouldn't put this on the regular agenda uh, but what they did was to include it in a dinner symposium because they felt it was too uh, provocative a subject to be uh, part of a regular program uh, and it was an eye opener for us because that dinner symposium uh, which started at about 7 o'clock uh, and and as i'm sure you know in in lahore there are no cocktails which come uh, with dinner uh, so they started at 7 and uh, at 9:30 they had to actually close it down because uh, the uh, the hall was full there were people standing outside they they just wouldn't be able to stop speaking about what it is that they and more importantly their the earlier generation had gone through uh in uh, and during uh, the partition so it's i mean partition as you all know is is one of the largest is is the largest uh, translocation of uh, uh, human beings and it is as much about the horrific uh, arson violence rape killing murder everything uh as it is about the displacement and very often the narratives of partition get hijacked by the obvious nature of the violence and the the clearly horrific nature of the violence what 
our friend Alok Rai, Rai calls the, the pornography of violence, in a sense, as it were. And, and the fact is that it is real. It's, it's very, very difficult to get away from that. But also what is happening is the displacement, <coughs> is, is, is the complete loss of agency. So we, in the morning, in the afternoon, when we were talking about the translocation of the patients in the mental hospital who got shifted from the hospitals, the mental hospitals in, in Pakistan to India or the people who got shifted from the hospitals in India and were sent across to Pakistan, these were the people in the institutions. There were people in jails who got shifted as well. But forget these people for the moment. All those hundreds and thousands of people who were forcibly, I mean not, not, they were not picked up and moved, but they were left with absolutely no choice in the matter. They had to move. From all accounts of partition, or from all accounts of what happened in those really troubled times, the expectation was that people would not move, that, that governments come, governments go, that you know, people continue to live where they are, they cope with whatever it is. I think the, the scale of the turbulence, I think, just took a whole different life of its own triggering off a huge amount of translocation. And what that did, that loss of choice, that complete loss of agency that it evoked, attended to by huge amounts of violence, uh, is what left all the traumas of partition uh, and really deep-seated traumas of partition. And the fact is that, you know, as I said, uh, mainstream psychiatry has not been able to talk about this. So this book, in a sense, is an attempt to address those silences. So we are looking at different things. We are looking at what happens in the institutions. We're looking at what happens in the medical services. We're looking at the thinkings behind uh, what, what those mind states are, the fact that, you know, it. It, it takes existing fault lines, it deepens them, it builds upon them, it, and all the other chapters that Sanjeev has talked about. These are a series of conversations that we've been having over the last uh, eight, nine years now. And it is still, I think, a first step in, in building on those conversations. So this is the, this is the result of that. We hope you uh, enjoy reading it, and we hope uh, that you know that this leads to uh, many more conversations around this subject. Thanks, Alok. Uh, recognizing that many of us may not have had the opportunity to read the book, uh, just to continue the uh, you know the various uh, points that you've raised, I'll actually give you a brief synopsis. <laughs> of the different chapters in a little bit more detail so that you know you kind of really perceive the length and breadth of this uh, of this book so there have been psychiatrists who have contributed to this book there have been people who work in the field of literature the people who are involved in gender studies uh, so there's a wide variety of different authors who've um, lent to this book the pre preface has been signed off by dr narinder wig who, is the one of, who was one of the very well-known psychiatrists in the country. And uh, in the preface, we talk about how psychiatry you know, changed from a peripheral presence in the mental hospitals to more mainstream uh, you know, medical disciplines. However, the lens that we started, uh, you know, through which we looked at patients, became, around the time of independence, a very biological lens. We were very preoccupied, not so much with the experiential, but with the experimental. We wanted empirical proof for what treatments we were giving to people. And I think somewhere along the line, we forgot the person behind the presentation. So to that extent, I think one wonders whether one looks at partition through the psychiatry gaze, or whether we just look at people who were moved 
from one mental hospital to another, or the metaphorical meaning of partition, the whole madness of partition. Do you look at that? In the afternoon, somebody was telling us, shouldn't we be looking at it from a, you know, a human rights perspective, from a sociological uh, perspective? So that's the perspective that we really haven't looked at it from. This evening we heard uh, one of our uh, guests here it ha looked at it from the economic perspective. So I think the whole idea is to wi you know, widen the gaze uh, you know, in which one looks at the whole issue of partition. And uh, you know, the kind of difficulties, uh, you know, it, one, if one calls it the madness of partition, I might say there has been a catatonia around the discussion on partition. You know, catatonia is basically a, a, a silent, mute state. And perhaps there has been this kind of uh, you know, response in terms of not discussing the impact that translocation can have on people, their lives, their attitudes, and persona, and how actually it's not just the individual impact that it has, but the transgenerational impact that such translocations can have. And I think that's very, very important to examine, even if many of us haven't actually been witness to these events, but actually carry on the emotional states, you know? So, do we look at it from a medical gaze? Do we look at it from a historical gaze? From a social gaze? Or even from the gaze of an individual psychological perspective and really understand what people have gone through? I won't focus so much on the chapters that Sanjeev and Alok specifically referred to. Uh, you know, there was there was this. There have been some reviews subsequent to to the release of the book, and one is by Amandeep, who you know who talked about the partition was supposed to forever sort out Hindu-Muslim issues. Uh, so we did not have a f more than a physical divide. We had a attempt at kind of separating people by religion. Uh, and we have not, as a nation, learned from the greatest tragedy of the, human, of the uh, Asian subcontinent or collectively dealt either with the trauma or with the psychosis this event created in our lives. In fact, we were talking about retribution in, in the morning. And you know, uh, so we wondered, I mean, retribution occurs with murder, murderers and their victims. But when you look at uh, this kind of uh, issue, without really understanding the events and the, and the pathos that went with it, it's very often impossible to kind of forget and move on. And therefore, you know, we need to address our collective unconscious and, and look at the, you know, the, the various issues. Um, inquiries in psychiatry, you know, we, we go in from, from a very academic angle and uh, we therefore need to move back from the experimentational to the experiential, from empirical validation to a subjective understanding of various views, from statistical measures to actually qualitative experiences. And that's what this book attempts to do. Uh, the, it looks at the actual vivisection, uh, as well as, uh, you know, for example, uh, Alok's and uh, Dr. Kala's, uh, you know, uh, work looks at the way the, the patients were actually moved from the hospitals in Pakistan to, uh, to India. And they quote Ismat uh, you know, Chuktai saying, not only was the country split, but bodies and minds were divided, families were separated, and bonds of relationship were in tatters. And I think uh, even today, when we've spoken to a few people who actually you know, had their rootedness in different places. It is impossible 50, 60 years after they've actually moved to remote places from their place of origin, their need or this craving for rootedness is something that just doesn't go away, even if they're well settled in different parts of the world. And of course, the irony of Manto's protagonist, Bishan Singh from Lahore, uh, who, whose villages in Toba take Singh, and he dies in no man's land. I think that's particularly poignant when you don't have a country or a place to call your own, how disturbing it can be. And how his nonsensical mutterings were looked at as neologisms, neologisms and nobody really tried to understand the kind of anguish 
uh, you know, that was created when he lost his identity and personhood. Uh, Maushmi Basu, as Sanjeev mentioned, takes on the discussion of partition to larger analogies in different countries in the world, how states legitimize their position towards individual and cultural ideas that are perceived as threats to the state. And perhaps there are reverberations of these to the very day, even to the present day. So there is all, always these issues of majority and minority, us and the other, insider and the outsider, which underlie various kinds of partitions. And how such themes defy the democratic attributes of citizenship, belongingness, equality, and non-discrimination are things that she alludes to. It's not just the event of partition, but the, you know, the themes of partition which continue to pervade our day-to-day -day lives now, the themes of alienation, ghettoization, and of course, day-to-day -day stress. We did a study on well-being a few years ago, and it was amazing that although people in society generally perceived reasonable well-being, certain minority communities faced a huge day-to-day -day stress, you know, that it was very, very difficult for them to handle. She brings, of course, psychiatry and psychology into the discourse and puts psychiatrists in a rather negative light, given, of course, you know, the ideologies of Serbian nationalism and uh, the two psychiatrists who <coughs> occupied very, you know, senior political positions and who built up a hysteria that helped to create a wedge between communities. Uh, Sanjeev, in his uh, thing, talks about the individual and group identities and goes on to talk about the uh, actual, uh, you know, the vivisection of hospitals and staff as part of the uh, partition. Tarun Saint defines partition as madness, talks about the historical trauma uh, which was experienced in different, uh, you know, different forms, uh, not just by the victims, but by what, what happened with the bystanders and the witnesses uh, across the classes and community. Hina Nandrajok talks about violence and rape as metaphors of madness. Madness swept across this country, uh, the land in an increasing crescendo, she says. She also talks about Gandhi's admonition not to counter madness with madness, which was really the madness of partition. Uh, she refers to the infectious nature of hatred, the outbreaks of rioting, the psychic contagion, and the sixth river in Punjab, which was the river of hate. The tired metaphor of madness of course, you know, again goes back to the story of, you know, Dera Baba Nanak, who describes partition as a sense of being dismembered and scattered in all directions. Sharma and Sabarwal visit Gandhi's month uh, following uh, the uh, independence somewhere in late 1947, and again refer to anger as a short-term madness. Uh, Gandhi's expressed thoughts during his uh, visits to Delhi and Calcutta, when there was a lot of rioting in these places, uh, which is a reflection of the fragmentation of post-partition India, deeply uh, confused, conflicted, enraged. His response is far from the historical triumph of independence. In fact, it's one of extreme sadness because of the police violence, because of the hooliganism, and the resultant what is called the psychosis. He refers to the mindless separation of persons purely on religion as a suicidal policy, but that's here to stay. Aisha Kidwai's uh, essay on gender talks about women as commodity, something that uh, Sanjeev referred to already, and the stories that she narrates are very startling and poignant. Abducted women as the spoils of war, with the spirited Punjabis outdoing each other in engraving personalized symbols of their victory on their victims. Adolescent girls whose essence is now only carnal hunger. But again, there are reverberations even in present times. If you read the news now on how a particular group in order to evict another community actually use rape as a form of violence against communities. So uh, they've also talked about how women were, you know, they attempt, there were attempts to rescue women and the varied responses of victimization, rejection, 
stigma, anger, and need for self-preservation. And of course, how the social workers actually managed to try and bring relief, but they, we, they lacked the right spirit, which had to be the order of Christian missionaries, which was perhaps not existent at that time. So Keshi's Kamra's analysis in detail is about the various kinds of rhetoric, including the rhetoric of violence that pervaded the discussion at that time, the various vocabularies of nationalism that was talked about, and uh, how that resulted in a fracturing of the very history of the built community. Subsequently, uh, we've, in the last chapter, we've tried to put together how the discipline of psychiatry needs to look within itself, try to engage the individual uh, with the, uh, the person within the individual and not just understand them as sterile clinical objects of understanding. And of course, how the metaphors of madness have pervaded even jargon. For example, within India, the mental hospital and the madman was a cultural metaphor. You know, going dulali in English or Anglo uh, Indian settings meant sending people to the mental hospitals in Agra, Bareilly, or Ranchi, and of course the Pagal Khanas. And uh, these kind of themes, of course, are there, you know, internationally as well. Uh, finally, I think the mental anguish that Mahatma Gandhi actually uh, reflected is amplified in today's polarized world, and we therefore need to understand that many of these themes continue to pervade. Uh, you know, our current day existence and therefore perhaps understanding the agony of partition also perhaps helps us to understand our current polarizations as well and perhaps is going to be a way to help us to move on, not as fragmented parts of society, not by religion or caste, but actually having a more humanistic approach in the way we deal with each other and we look at progress uh, in, in current day life. So that's really a little bit of a synopsis of the entire book, and I'll pass it on to you, sir, for your more personal accounts. Thank you. Uh, I am at a disadvantage not having read the book, but, uh, also, uh the interest in partition, uh, I'm curious about that, uh, has uh, increased in the last 10 years or so, starting with Urvashi Butalia's book and now the Partition Museum being set up in Amritsar, the uh, archival, archival recordings being made in England and USA and even in India. Uh, is it the fact that the distance has now enabled uh, the present generation to look at this collective madness and this holocaust because it was nothing short of our holocaust and so much has been written about holocaust but uh, we are coming to grips with partition only now and the silence that uh, you talked about is silence a way of dealing with this trauma now um, in 1961, at a family friend's house, and, um, I was introduced to a person, one of their distant relatives, and they said, he's the one, I think even Visham Swani has written about him, he's the one who killed nine women folk of his house. And um, I looked at him, he just smiled. <coughs> now, how does one deal with that kind of uh, situation? So maybe you need distance, and that was the silence. Now, when you deal with a person like that who had to kill his mother, sister, sisters-in-law, whatever, so that they would not be soiled uh, and the family honor not be dishonored, I mean, this is the kind of trauma which needs distance. So maybe silence was the one way of coping with, coping with it. What do you say that now this interest and the silence earlier, aren't they uh, two sides of the coin? So uh, the dealing with all uh, trauma will need some distance. Uh, and there uh, obviously can be no, uh, you know, 
uh, no doubt about that. Uh, <clears throat> even uh, a lot of the Holocaust studies came out after a, a fairly large uh, gap. Here, apart from the uh, distance, uh, from the the sheer enormity of the trauma, the collective sort of the the narrative that is created uh, is further complicated by the ambiguity of the narrative. Ki unhone kia ki hamne kia ki who it who is it who has done these things? Because it's, it's so much simpler and so much more comfortable to construct narratives in which unspeakable or the unspeakable nature of uh, the event remains unspoken. Right. So apart from the, the sheer horror of it, uh, the fact of a, a collective victimhood and a collective guilt. Because it's, no, it's not that any, any one community uh, thought of itself as, as only victims or as only perpetrators. So therefore, see, memorialization of the Holocaust uh, in, in the construction of narrative uh, the the blacks and whites and some shades of grey that you know maybe people got swept away with or could not help themselves in doing this uh, those those shades are clearly uh, yes. uh, that's uh, right here yeah. those shades are so intermingled yes yes in fact the Pakistani poet. Uh, uh, um, Ustad Daman uh, has a poem, Akhandi Lali Dasdi e Roi Tusi Vio Roi Asi Vio. This means the redness of your eyes shows that you have cried as well as we have cried. So it's the same situation because it's not black and white. But I, there's another thing now. Can I just add a bit yeah. to that? See, the issue is not about the silence, the issue <coughs> the, which, which upset Alok and all of us is the, this, uh, let's say the memorializing of the Holocaust and the way it has looked, the academic debate about what happened started immediately after the Second World War itself. There was an academic discussion, there were, there were seminars, there were discussions, Hannah Arendt to, to, you know, there was a whole debate and discussion which allowed people to talk about their sorrow and the trauma. Here, because the professional classes, in our case the psychiatrists, maintain the silence, even if people wanted to talk, who would they talk to? Who, who was there to listen? Because we, it was a collective wall of silence and it was not the job, it was definitely the job of the professionals to have penetrated that wall of silence more proactively and that is a worrying thing. No, but you see, as Dr. Saab just now mentioned, in the case of Holocaust, and ours is also Holocaust, but one can say the German Holocaust, uh, the lines were clearly drawn, more or less. Here, the lines are not drawn. But, I mean, coming to the silences, I remember my father and his classmates and even others, whenever they got together, uh, there would be laughter and they would be remembering their college days, etc., but never talk about the trauma. This was one way of coping with that. Now here, uh, Nakra Saab is here, his father has written a book, uh, Vichra Vatan, which means uh, the land left behind. Now, it's a nostalgic account of uh, uh, the, uh, the, their native place. But even though it is tinged with nostalgia, the tone is sunny. And it was written just a few years ago. And uh, now uh, the, 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 the great chronicler of uh, pre-partition culture and partition, uh, Krishna Sobti, <coughs> has come out with a novel just last year, a, a year before her, her death, Gujarat, Pak Punjab, say Gujarat, Pakistan. I don't know if it has been translated into English yet or not, but 
I mean, this is such a live thing. And uh, also, um, again, as I said, people, to cope with the stress and trauma, looked at the sunnier side. And also, if you look at literature, unlike the Holocaust literature, there are as many stories about the common humanity, about the goodness. I mean, in, in uh, more so, I think, in Punjabi uh, than in Bengali, because Bengali literature uh, also has those examples. But for example, the kind of searing writing in Manik Bandopadhyay's novels or Ritwik Ghatak's films, uh, I think because of this, the situation is much more complicated because there are examples of common humanity also, of goodness also in all this. So uh, what does one say about this? Can I, can I respond to that? And I, I think that's quite startling. I mean, given the, the, you know, the impact, the kind of things that were happening, I mean, it's wonderful to have what you're saying, this a sense of nostalgia about the younger days, well-lived, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and a sense of helping each other. But the, it's, it's almost like a, I mean, if I can use the term, a schizophrenic splitting response to look at only these sides and not actually look at the pain, the, 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 you know, the, the hurt, the <coughs> guilt, the devastation that occurred. And somehow, perhaps, as a society, we need to look at both these things. I mean, I think it's wonderful to look at resilience and really see how people were able to kind of you know, relive some of their early, early days. But at the same time, also to be able to look at the other side, the suffering, et cetera, uh, you know? But, uh, doctor, to psychiatrists, my question would be, has a study been done or uh, anywhere, I mean, not only in India, how is it that people who are living uh, together, uh, living in such uh, uh, friendliness, neighborliness, and suddenly they become enemies and become bloodthirsty. What triggers that kind of violence? The, 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 the animal in human being, uh, what brings that out so suddenly? So there, are, there have been a number of studies. One of the first studies was a study by UNESCO uh, Gardner Murphy, an American psychologist, was asked to do an inquiry on why this, exactly this phenomenon had happened, where people who had been friends and neighbors for years had uh, started, had done all this violence. So he went around, interviewed people, made scales of psychological distancing, and distancing proved a very important thing. Would you eat from the same plate? Would you share a seat? And this is a time when, uh, to his credit, he notes this minute detail. There's a strike organized in Ahmedabad because of the pre-independence, I obviously haven't seen it, but there apparently used to be Hindu taps and Muslim taps at all railway stations and all factories. Yeah, and Hindu Pani, Muslim, Muslim Pani. Pani. And the government of India said, after independence, we will not allow this. And there was a strike in, in uh, Gujarat saying that we have to have that. And the government said, no matter what you do, those taps are not coming back. So he, Gardner Murphy points, it, points out that the government is making an effort to remove these little petty barriers between people. But the comment he makes is very interesting. He says India will need literacy. It will need a literacy of spirit, not just education. What use is education if you lose the, the, the uh, sense of, of conviviality and commonality? And when he analyzes the riots, he finds that areas which had playgrounds where children of all communities played together had the least likelihood of violence. So it's a very simple observation. But what do, you, what do we find? That even playgrounds get segregated. So the, the, the partitioning of common spaces, whether in our mind or in the geographical space, has a, has a domino effect on separating our minds. And Gardner Murphy points out all these things as to how these things would have an effect, and in the future, what are the things to be avoided? And this is a very elaborate, it's a whole book by Gardner Murphy, and it's a fascinating thing. It's called In the Minds of Men, because he says all this, all this partition violence was actually playing out something that had first been lived inside their minds. So it's a, it's a fairly interesting book, and the UNESCO, thanks to, uh, thanks to UNESCO for 
having initiated this. There are studies like this from Yugoslavia and, you know, so there, there's been considerable interest yeah, in this. It's interesting that you mentioned UNESCO because the charter of UNESCO begins with these words, since wars are yes, generated in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men that defenses of peace must be built. So, so I suppose title, taking derives, on that. The title derives from the yeah, UNESCO charter. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you see, another thing which you mentioned also uh, in your uh, uh, summing up of the book about uh, the, the, the sense of loss which uh, has not gone. For example, today in Delhi you have uh, Sargoda Association, you have Miawali Association, and you have uh, all the associations from all the districts. And whenever two Punjabis meet, uh, even today they ask, from where are you? And if you say, I'm from Bangalore, and then say, no, no, but actually, <laughs> so both of you would have undergone that experience. Uh, so this, how does one, uh, uh, talk about this loss or, uh, I mean, there is no way you can compensate for this. And also, you see the Punjabi and Sindhi biraderies, I mean, Bengali one knows only from the literature, I suppose someone from Bengal here can probably speak about that. The sense of biradri, I mean, it's a concept which is difficult to translate, but the biraderies were rent asunder. And that's, I think all these Miyawali Association, <coughs> Sargoda Association, Rawal Pindi Association, etc., are an attempt to capture that sense of lost biradri. So, so actually, I, we start, the book, in a sense, may have, must have started in my head long ago in that sense. So in Delhi, there's a place called Shankar Market, next to Kalant Place, which is a very old bookshop. And I was second-hand bookshop, so I was there buying second-hand books when I was in college. So he asked me, I was obviously had spent a lot of time and gone back to him over and over again. So finally got curious, where are you from? So I said, Lajpat Nagar. So he said, you are a refugee. Now, this is a person I was obviously born well after the partition. But his knowledge of Delhi was that anybody who doesn't live, so I said, you know, they go Haley Road a little bit. So his idea of Delhi finished at Haley Road. And everybody who was not within that Delhi was not a Delhi wala. So, for the first time in my life, I was labelled as a refugee. So, I had never thought of myself as a refugee before. But this bookshop owner insisted on calling me a refugee. So, it was a very strange kind of uh, thing, and which, uh, you know, goes back. So, you know, I grew up in, uh, in, in a so-called refugee colony of Delhi. And these biradris and these clans and networks of, you know, uh, they were real, literally rent asunder. And over time, with the changing social mores of, of India, those kinds of social rootedness has definitely taken a hit. Now, what has replaced it, we have no idea. So, but we have definitely lost a sense of a shared commons of various things. So the uh, other thing is that, see, the fact is that uh, all stories are complex, all stories have nuances. The fact that there is a, a historical uh, Ganga Jamni, which is a, a, a harking back to a, a past which is of, you know, fraternity and well-being, uh, which is partly real, partly nostalgic, and that this story also incorporates the, the, the rending asunder with, with a lot of violence, and the fact that, you know, can there be studies which will answer this in, in non-complex ways, uh, probably not. Because, because historically we've seen this uh, so many times. 1984, for example. Yeah. Between Hindus and Sikhs, uh, the 
question of uh, wedges uh, uh, is not something that we would have thought of as as even possible yeah. uh, till politics uh, comes in the way. Uh, but the sort of absolutely insane amounts of violence that we witnessed uh, in 84, uh, which, uh, which again has passed, you know, which, which has not left uh, that sort of scarring because uh, there is nothing which fed which, or which continued to feed into this. So the fact that all of these will have complex, multifaceted uh, answers uh, is probably something that we have to recognize and and talk about and you know uh, and hopefully understand a lot better. I suppose so, but the cultural loss has also been tremendous because uh, I I don't think I mean while people have been talking of uh, the violence done to women, obviously in all such situations the worst is experienced by the women. And uh, uh, the, 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 the violence in general, violence on women, etc. But the violence to culture and uh, to language, that has, uh, I think, not been given the uh, uh, attention that it deserved. Now, uh, yesterday I was reading an article in Vaichariki, the latest issue of Vaichariki, which is a Hindi magazine published from uh, Bikane and Calcutta. Uh, and it's about Sindhi literature. And uh, it, it's very interesting that in India, in Sindhi, which is another uh, victim of partition, the language, the culture, at least in Punjab, even though it is a truncated Punjab, you have Punjab, a base for culture and the language, but Sindhis have no such base in India. 43 novels have been written in India and only 36 in uh, uh, Pakistani Indus. So that's an indication of the kind of uh, cultural uh, violence that has taken place. Uh, how does one cope with that? I suppose there is no simple answer. Yes. Uh, the psychologist did try to answer it. There is a person called Beni Prasad Agarwal, who is a professor of psychology at the Allahabad University in 1940. He goes on to become the mayor of uh, Allahabad, and we very recently we met somebody who had actually shaken hands with him because he, he got the best student award or whatever. But he's a PhD from Oxford, and he's, uh, he's uh, trained in... Um, uh, he's a, he's a, he wrote a book on the Hindu-Muslim conflict and its psychological uh, treatment in a, somewhere in the early 40s. So he said that this idea that they have separate cultural spaces is so dangerous that I can't even begin to imagine it. This is a culture in evolution. We are trying to make a unified culture which is unique to India. This is a work in progress. And for, uh, for you to expect me to believe that these are constant warring factions is completely against everything that I live, believe, or teach. And it's a very uh, heartfelt statement. And uh, you know the way he goes about understanding how this whole process of cultural division is taking place, whether it's the replacement of Urdu by Hindi in the, in the UP uh, legislatures, and the way the poetry and the, uh, you know, the language itself is being is being distanced. And so they were counter voices at this point, protesting against the cultural destruction of a syncretic culture and forcing people to live very, very nasty, Hobbesian, short and brutal lives. So there is a purpose in making sure that the natives do not get beyond what you're allowed. So natives have to be seen as nasty, brutish and short. And the thinking has to be manipulated so that it confirms the native trope of being nasty, brutal, and short, and uncivilized people. So that is a theme that comes up over and over again, that nothing better can be expected of them because they are, after all, savages. So that's that kind of thing which pervades it through and through. Also, you see this uh, stereotyped image of Punjabis as loud and uh, uh, consumerist and all that. 
Because having lost everything, when you're starting from a scratch and you come up in life, obviously your uh, uh, sensibilities are going to change. And I think this is also part of cultural violence that has taken place as part of partition. And curiously enough, uh, if you read uh, about uh, the Lakhnavis who went to Karachi, the Lakhnavis on this side, they say they have become very crude and they have lost all the Lakhnavi refinement, etc. So the victims of partition on both sides, I think the, 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 the cultural damage and is as much as psychological damage because the two have gone together. Perhaps we can now open yeah. it up to the audience for your comments, questions. Can I? Yes, please. Good evening. First of all, pardon me, I have not read your book. So, uh, yeah, first of all, I have not read your book, pardon me for that. And, uh, but I live in an area where I have predominantly people coming from Multan, Shikaripur, Hyderabad, Karachi, Jang, Myanmali too. And I have talked to all those elders, the first generation of elders who were living. That time, maybe very, very few, maybe still living. The cultural violence, what you are talking, sir, I have asked them that. You at least knew your culture, what didn't you propagate with your children or communities? They said, better, our focus was only on survival. There was no time for cultural aspects. This is the answer I got from many of them. Survival was the only thing, what I will do next for my living and building house, building the families, rather than any propagating the culture to the children and things like that. And the second thing is, uh, I, many of them wanted to longing to go back to see their houses. Some of them went, some of them were treated very well. Some of them were not let inside also. But those who went and treated very well, strangely enough, they were telling me after coming back, even though their house was still there, somebody else was living, they're happy somebody is living, maintaining the house, and looking after the things. And one regret or what they expressed their expectation and aspiration was, if it is possible whether my son sir can take my remains after I die, back to my village and bury it there or spread the ash. This is a very common thing I could uh, see. I don't know the psychological, uh, psychiatry aspect of it. But this, I don't know why it exists in their mind. It should be scattered in the land of their forefathers who lived there for generations. Perhaps this discussion also I was just occurred to my mind. Even we can understand the Kashmiri Pandits. Today they regret very much that their culture is getting eroded. Many Kashmiris, they don't speak Kashmiri anymore, they're speaking Hindi. In Pune, I'm just uh, telling you, this is the regret of the parents that the children are losing the cultural aspect, what has happened because of the displacement or whatever it is. Thank you. Hello. I think Dr. Alok mentioned the word refugee, and then later on, Dr. Sandeep also mentioned that today's generation may not know the word and the meaning of that word refugee. So the people who got displaced from Pakistan to India they were able to, to some extent, overcome the difficulties in a generation of maybe two. But the people who got displaced from India to Pakistan, they are still called Muhajis. So what do you think was the difference from the psychology point of view, or environment point of view, or the political environment point of view, that this difference came up? It's, uh, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's difficult to give a... Uh, 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 how should I say, a formulaic answer to that. It has to do with the uh, ethos, it has to do with the assimilation, it has to do with the uh, syncretism of, of society. Uh, so the, the Hindus who came uh, at the time of partition to, to India uh, had their own challenges, but I think uh, managed to uh, 
assimilate far better than the Muslims who went, uh, who were, who continued to be seen as outsiders. And so clearly, uh, the way that the countries view themselves and the, the way, so the whole question as to how individuals heal, how micro communities heal or not heal, how larger societies heal, uh, or whether they heal or not, uh, is are actually much larger questions. So it's it's obviously that you know some things obviously we did right, and many things we did not speak about. We could have done far worse, which doesn't make uh, what the we did not speak about uh, all right. I mean, so the fact that we need to talk about these things, but the assimilation in the two countries clearly was was actually quite different. I don't know whether that's actually quite correct. Let me, in the current context, for example, when Alok and I were visiting um, the Northeast, we were trying to get some material. We were working on psychiatry in any case, and we went to these areas. And there's a very intriguingly, bureaucratically horrible name called permanent liability areas, which are camps for refugees from Bangladesh, Hindu refugees, whom Assam will not accept because they're Bengalis. Bengal will not accept because they moved to Assam. And they're actually stateless people. They're permanent liability areas because neither the government of Assam nor Bengal or Tripura will accept them. They are called PLA, permanent liability people. So this is what we reduce people to. So even the 21st century, there are people who are still suffering refugeehood in India. They have not been assimilated. Then those labels stick to them. Now with the new necessity of proving your nationhood by cards, we'll get a new generation of refugees. Because this kind of what is the, the, the card system, you can be designed, you can be designated a refugee by a click of a button. You can be stateless. So let us not imagine that the word refugee has gone out of our bureaucratic processing. We can all become refugees by a click of a button. Sir. Sir. May I? Shall I go ahead? OK. Um, I'm a child of parents that came from Sindh. I'm a Sindhi. And uh, you talked about silence. And uh, I think the silence was really because the peop my parents had to get on with the business of living and providing. And I think they didn't have the time or the energy to actually spend on being, uh, you know, uh, to regret what happened or whatever else. Uh, but the strange thing was that when my father was 83 years old, he was having an operation. And when he was coming out of sedation, uh, it was really traumatic because his whole memory had gone back to the partition days. So I think the silence actually came because everything was embedded in the subconscious. All he was thinking about was he was calling out to my mother and saying, has she crossed the border? Has she crossed the border safely? Has my son crossed the border? And those were the things that bothered him. So I think that it was a lot in the subconscious. And they didn't actually want to bring it out because, you know, I think there was nothing to be gained out of actually talking about it. And I lived a very happy life because they never talked about it. They didn't talk about the partition, but it came up at that point. Subsequently, he suffered from Alzheimer's. And in that situation and in that frame of mind, what he was doing was he used to actually go to bed with his shoes on. And he had a shirt and a pant lying under his pillow ready to charge at a moment's notice. And that was the trauma. And I, and I didn't actually ever, I was never exposed to this. Only before he died, I realized the trauma that the parents had suffered during the partition. Well, this is a common experience, madam, because my grandfather suffered a stroke in early uh, 50s. And uh, he went back to his uh, pre-partition days, his old village, and never returned to the present. So this is a 
This is a common experience of many people. And uh, as I mentioned, probably this is the this was probably the only way you could deal with that trauma. I'm sure they would uh, speak more about how to handle trauma. But, but there's something called the Ribos law of forgetting. You're likely to forget a lot of the recent events, but you know your earlier events remain with you, and these clearly kind of come out in times of stress. Um, I have Sir, I am. So here, here. Yeah, Do, yeah. Though I have born after the 10 years of independence, still I am just thinking about, I am very eager and curious to know that whether the partition is inevitable or is it a tricky place, a tricky game played by the British before leaving the India as a part of divide and rule policy? Because with the background of all these discussions. <laughs> and last one. Why is so severe, even after the 17 years, still that uh, partition term is so burning issue? Just, just I want to know the background of historian. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just very quickly try to answer that, but I had a question of my own which I want to come to. You know, uh, uh, the first thing is uh, uh, no one man or woman could have stopped partition. So not Gandhi, not Jinnah, not uh, Nehru, not Patel, uh, and so on. Uh, arguably, the roots of partition go back to, in my view, uh, the separate electorates granted in 1909. Uh, some would say not that far, maybe Gandhi's Khilafat movement in the 1920s. Some would say, OK, 1937, when uh, the elections took place. But partition effectively with separate it. It could have been done with loss of life. It minimized loss of life. There were some terrible strategic blunders made by Lord Mountbatten in particular in not deploying army regiments in the Punjab and not you know, easing out the transition so that administration went and so on. It could have done much less loss of life. But uh, maybe you know, it, it goes back to 1909 and separate elections. But the question I wanted to raise, if I may, is about the scholarly work on partition. Now, the uh, survivor silence you understand. And some of the personal testimonies have come. Why you know you had to survive, you had to build your lives. It was all inside you. It came out. Sanjeev, you know you. Uh, I want to slightly take issue with you. Maybe you are too harsh on the scholarly community of India, including uh, the psychiatrists and also the social scientists, as to why they were silent, and especially the uh, the comparison with the Holocaust. Now there are several differences between what happened in India how India coped with partition and how uh, Germany and others coped with the Holocaust. The first difference is, of course, that Germany had it. They were older nation states with at least uh, some nostalgic understanding of when Jews were part of society. Right. So you could say, how could the land of Goethe do this? OK. You had a novelist like Thomas Mann invoking those old images and saying, you know, this is an aberration, you know, and this is horrible, and uh, atone for it. So that's, whereas here there was no such history. Secondly, as all of you have pointed out, in this case, unlike the Holocaust, uh, it, there was no black and white. They, everyone was a victim, everyone was a perpetrator, right? So, and thirdly, uh, now, then, since you didn't have a history of uh, 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 nationhood without violence, you said, OK, now at least we'll create a new nation. At least our new India will have Hindus and Muslims living together. Let's focus on that, right? And finally, uh, the point is about the British. We had the British to blame, so it was displaced to someone else. So once the displacement took place, you know, we don't have to take account of what happened. So I think what I'm trying to say in, in some is, you know, uh, maybe uh, for all these reasons, particularly the idea that the intellectual energies of this new nation have to be poured into constructive work, into building solidarity, economic development. I you could not have expected uh, either sociologists or psychologists or psychiatrists to be, you know, breast beating about how horrible we were. Yeah. So the issue is not about uh, uh, culpability, uh, and the issue actually should not, to our minds, be about the culpability. The issues should be about the of this opportunity to understand trauma, coping, healing, non-healing, 
silences. This is the, this is the, this is the issue. Even but this is what psychiatry is. This is what mental health is. This is what, this is what finding solution to mental health. Yes. So, so let, 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 let me put it in this way. Uh, so there is, a, we've been working on the life of one doctor called Satyanand. Now, there is a, he's the he's the founder of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the first professor of psychiatry. He's the mental, he's the, he's a doctor in the Lahore Mental Hospital and Amritsar Medical College. And he has a design for a new man for the new world. And he says the only place this can occur is India. Because India has a 2,000 year of civilization. If we cannot understand the basic issues which, which bother man with a capital M, then the rest of the world is doomed. So we have to understand the working of the human psyche which has gone through all these traumas, which has gone through all this, and try to understand how we'll make a new man for the new world in India. Now, this is the optimism with which, so this is 1952, that a vision of a new man and a new India is being enunciated in a psychiatric text. By 1960, it is 10% rise, 2% discount, 4% accountancy of the bureaucracy, health budgets have to be cut down, we cannot have such fancy ideas, and all these ideas are given short shrift. So the way psychiatry, it's not, it's not, the, it's not the issue that the breastfeeding and uh, building nation was not there. <coughs> the attention being paid to the people who were coming to you, did you ask them what happened to you? Did you document what happened to you? Did you worry about what happened to you? Journals were coming out, journal seminars were being held, programs were being held, nowhere is this mentioned. So that's the issue. Add to that. I, I think it's it's not so much about just blaming psychiatrists for for the partition and not talking about it. It's also for now a myopia in terms of the way. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. In a myopia in the way we look at our patients and the need to perhaps have a more ecological understanding of you know of where they come from rather than just a clinical diagnosis and medication. I think that's why you know I think we we talked about the larger social gaze. Uh, Wing Commander Butt, uh, do I speak? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the whole premise, like I went to the National Defense Academy, at a young age of 16, we study military history, principles of war. So the premise for this whole thing has to start with geopolitics. Churchill created Pakistan. Why after partition, Nobody looked at it like the uh, Jews look, looked at it after the Second World War, was simply because there were a lot of military guys, in fact, it's all documented, said, so let's take some photos because people are not going to believe this happened. And here you had Nehru as a Fabian socialist. Everybody signed for partition, barring uh, Gandhi and uh, Maulana Azad, including Sardar Patel on 6th Jan uh, 1947. The whole uh, aim of this partition and this Mojahai stuff, what we're talking about, is basically the Punjabi Muslim domination out there. So <clears throat> if we, we, we really can't, uh, this lady in the USA is doing a wonderful job with the 1947 partition archive. And uh, we can't come to grips with this because every time we have a war, a lot of my NDA cosmetics have died in this war, tortured, etc. We get back to the fundamentals. We get back to the fundamentals. We, we can't have this utopian concept of, as you were saying, doctor, that, you know, let's have this idealistic man. We have to first look at the geopolitics of the whole thing. What Churchill wanted to prevent is the Chinese is doing that now. What Frederick the Great wanted to bring about to the warm water ports, that's, it. that's the whole issue that uh, Churchill was concerned about. So until and unless we look at things from that point, and, and let me just give you a parting shot. When I went to the Holocaust Museum in LA, they do an amazing thing, you know. They take you first into an empty room. So you're all wondering, why the hell are you in this empty room before you see ostrich there? And the lady says, look, we all have prejudices. And so we take you to, into this empty room to drop your prejudices and then go inside. Thank you.
Well, uh, I would say that questions about the politics of partition uh, need not be taken up here because this is not the occasion and the book is not about the politics of partition. When uh, Ram's book is discussed here sometimes, then these questions can be put to Ram. <laughs> so today we are talking about the partition and uh, the psychological and uh, the psychiatric response to partition and uh, how to bring about the healing touch when the when people have been traumatized, how to bring the healing touch. And by um, all uh, yardsticks, uh, people still have not got over the trauma of partition, not even the second generation when Dr. Saab himself is labeled as a refugee. <laughs> yes, continuing on that, uh, at the trauma, he says, uh, the second, third generation has not yet overcome. So I'm someone who's from the third generation now, and uh, we've grown up hearing stories from our grandparents. Both my mother's side and my father's side were, uh, uh, had come from Pakistan. So, uh, I mean, I visited the uh, museum in Amritsar, and I mean, it's just a step towards what, uh, I mean, I would like to go back to my ancestral village at least once and take a look at how it was or how, from where my roots are. So, uh, I mean, this yearning and, Fortunately, now on YouTube, you know, you have channels where uh, people from the other side and here are connecting with each other, and there are channels like the Punjabi Leher, Sanja Punjab, who are trying to do this kind of work. So, um, I mean, do you think it's uh, something that's, that should be encouraged? Because now you have this, you know, where contacts, they say, should not be held, and, you know, there's like this uh, staunch... Uh, <laughs> so, so we had uh, how many meetings in Lahore? Three. Two, two meetings in Lahore. We could not invite our <coughs> colleagues there because we wouldn't give them visas. They gave us visas. Very, diff very dubious visas, but they did give us visas. But what was interesting is this whole, you know, this divide aspect. So we were in Lahore and we wanted to visit the Gurdwara next to the Jama Masjid, which was used by Ranjit Singh. We had to be certified by another Sikh psychiatrist to enter the Gurdwara because as Indians, the government of Pakistan will not allow Hindus to enter Gurdwaras because we are anti-Sikh. So this was the label. We were not allowed to enter there till a Sikh colleague from England vouched for us that we are not likely to cause any destruction or any sacrilege inside the Gurdwara. So these kinds of tropes are very, very essential. Those person-to-person -person meetings, the fact that the uh, Harun Rashid Chaudhary, who had invited us, was naming the hospital for mentally ill in the honor of Dr. N. N. Vig from Chandigarh in 2004. A hospital was being named in Lahore about, on a doctor in India. Now, I don't think we would do that in that sense, we being all of us. So there is a whole thing to be gained. So there was a Sark Federation, there was an association of British South Asian psychiatrists, which has now morphed into British Indian psychiatrists and British Pakistani psychiatrists. So there are, this kind of meeting of minds is absolutely essential. Because as Ohinleg described to one of the doctors here, in the, I haven't put that in the book. So Affleck was the military general, or as we've seen talking about geopolitics, he said, India undivided is indefatigable. India divided is indefensible. So we have to understand that geopolitics, that if we continue to be divided, we are actually indefen you know, indefensible. And whether we want to be like that is a separate issue in our minds, as well as our bodies, and as our lands. Excuse me. When you see the young people are taken over to the yeah. other, yeah. they're in their 80s and 90s. Yeah. 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 Excuse me. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to refer. Uh, to the subject of silence. Uh, I'm, a, I, well, I, I'm a refugee from Germany and I was in England and nobody ever wants to hear about suffering. So, that is why there is a silence. Why was there so much silence after partition, after the horrible things happened? Pe people didn't want to hear it. 
Yes, Rajat. Perhaps I am the only one here who has some memory of the partition. I was a student of third standard when the partition took place. We came over to India. We went through the entire hardship of life, rebuilding our lives. I have one question to ask, and that is, even today, I have a desire to visit my village from where I came. I had two opportunities in my life to go. Once to lead an Indian delegation, and second time I was invited on a lecture tour. Both the times when I asked the government of India to give me permission to go, my secretary at the national level, he told me, oh, you were born in Pakistan, so you can't go. <laughs> what is that which still is in me, which wants to go back and see my village? And what is in the mind of the government of India, which does not allow me to go there? Thank you. Incidentally, uh, he's writing a book um, and uh, the account of partition which he has given, how his uh, brother died uh, of dehydration uh, during the journey and uh, breathed his last when they entered India and he asked, have we entered India? And then he breathed his last, those kind of incidents he's, uh, he's written. But I asked him to... Uh, uh, put more into the book and separate it from his uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, autobiography. So I, I hope the book would be published soon. Uh, but uh, the question which uh, uh, you have raised, you see, uh, I was in the Administrative Training Institute for a few years and we used to get these IAS officers for training um, uh, six to nine years, which is a, a fairly senior level in the IAS, nine years. I was appalled at uh, the um, kind of attitudes they had imbibed, um, uh, the, 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 the prejudices and all that. So government of India is all of us, and I suppose... <laughs> Those prejudices, they, they are carried over. Yeah. yeah. The question is, what is, what is it that impels him to go back to visit his village? This is in Sargoda district. Uh, see, stability and continuity of life is a very much a mental construct. So you're constantly imagining a kind of rootedness. And that imagined rootedness is as much important as your physical rootedness. So there is often a mismatch between the two, but the imagined in most of our lives is actually more real to us than our real life is. So, so that, 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 is a, that is a fact of life that, you know, our, imagine, our imaginary worlds are more important to us than our real worlds are. Yeah, so we have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was also born in what is currently Pakistan, but we came over before partition, so we didn't suffer from the trauma. Uh, but my point is that uh, I'm the second generation. As far as my son goes, he's now 40 years old, but I don't think he's least interested in what happened. What bothers him is the news that comes around about Pakistan, about, uh, you know, the kind of riots that take, take place these days. I mean, uh, the communalism that is bandied about. If, I mean, if the politics, uh, if Kashmir had not existed, for instance, things would have been very different because I don't think the next generation is really interested in what happened if... Uh, <laughs> If the politics of Kashmir, for instance, of, or, or nowadays, of course, ISIS and all had not been there. So it, this, this business of uh, scarring, just like in 1984, it's left no scars. This would also have left hardly any scars. And we have to move forward. Thank you.
One last point from no, one minute, uh, please, uh, Mrs. Nakra. Yes. yes. Uh, I would like to come back to uh, the two holocausts, and <coughs> I'm sorry, and the question of guilt and shame. Now, the, I'm a German, and I'm born after the Second World War, but even our generation grew up and still feels a collective <coughs> shame and guilt. What I see in the Indian population coming this side or that side is more the feeling of being victims rather than being perpetrators. So is there, do you sense a conflict if a person is both at the same time? For us it is very clear. I mean, we used to actually hide our nationality. We never used to uh, play the national anthem. The first time a feeling of some kind of pride in our country actually was expressed in the last World Cup, which was football World Cup, which was held in Germany um, after a very, very, very long time. But like our generation never felt that way. Um, so I would like to understand if the same thing is there in one person, being a victim as well as being a perpetrator. How does uh, one deal with that kind of conflict? I, I think you've hit upon the, a, a very important crux of this whole issue. Because, you know, uh, again, to put it in perspective uh, of our academic life, uh, many years ago, about almost a decade and a half ago, I read this very interesting psychotherapy article in which somebody, perhaps in Europe, was taking children of concentration camp guards to talk to children of the victims of those guards to see if the children could get along with each other. Could they understand, could they forgive what had happened to the parental generation and have a relationship with each other. So that kind of effort, it was purely, a, they were not ill in any sense. So this was, this was an effort to understand the social pathology as much as the individual pathology. Now, and this was perhaps in the late 80s or early 90s that th these efforts were being made. So, so that, so the sense of German guilt or shame, or the way it reflects out in the writings of the entire generation, right from Hendrik Biol to you know everybody down the line, we don't have that kind of writing in India. We have a perpetual victimhood or a silence. So there has been no reasonable, rational expunging of this. So if you don't come face to face with it, it's buried under the carpet, and like any demons under the carpet, it comes out and bites you ever so often. So unless we actually have a mature conversation about it, about what it actually meant, rather than just say that you know, silence is a silence, a collective silence was probably a healing process, it is not a healing process. It is a suppression. So suppressed emotions come up in nasty forms. That's the whole point of psychiatry most often. So we do need to understand that what the silence, was it a silence of anger? Was it a silence of shame? Was it a silence of guilt? Was it a silence of indifference? So silence itself can have many forms. And we need to debate all that. But you see, as has already been pointed out, the German situation was more black and white, whereas here you are dealing with greys. It's all grey. I mean, if uh, Pakistan, uh, if a train uh, comes to India with uh, people butchered in the train and they write uh, um, uh, food for India, Two, two trains go from this side or three trains go from this side with uh, uh, coal for Pakistan. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, it doesn't allow you to um, uh, talk in uh, black and white, uh, this thing, as in the case of Germany. But I think the literature about partition, uh, especially some very fine stories written in Punjabi, in, uh, uh, in Bengali also. Uh, I mentioned Manik Bandopadhyay's works. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, it is there, though we don't have somebody like Primo Levi still. <laughs> but uh, as has been pointed out, this was one way of coping with the trauma. 
And now, because of the distance, uh, distance in time, I think the, the much more is being talked about partition in the last five years than it has ever been talked earlier. Yes, sir. The displacement I, I, of Punjabis is today a history. Pardon me? The displacement of Punjabis yeah. is history now. Yeah. So the various generations now count out of the third of the fourth generation. It is the Kashmiri pundits yes. who are still alive in camps. Yeah. We have to understand their problems, what is what is the psychological impact on them. That is what is more important today. In today's context, Quite right. why do we choose to ignore it? Oh, I don't think it's uh, it's an. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to answer that because it's not being ignored. I mean, there are services. I mean, the whole system of services carries on. But uh, I think the reason why it's coming up again and again and more vehemently now in the last five or ten years is because you see a ratcheting it up of the rhetoric of the 30s and 40s. That the same kinds of tropes, the same kind of, of ideas are again coming up. All the optimism of the 50s and 60s is gradually dissipating and the same kind of hateful violence written rhetoric, as Sukeshi Kamra points out, is again being used. So would we have to face partitions again? It is not an empty question. And that is the reason why it is coming up again and again in the last five or six years. Incidentally, okay. I remember. Uh, no, I, I think, uh, remember reading a, a psychiatrist's a study of the refugee camp in Jammu, Kashmiri refugee camp. I'm sure you have also gone through that. The uh, stress is very high. Post-traumatic uh, syndrome is very much visible there. So it's not that they are not being looked at. They are being looked at. But you see, the scale of partition violence is such that uh, we still have not been able to collectively deal with it. Okay, I think I've been told that time is up, so I'd like to thank all the panelists. Thank you very much for the discussion. <laughs> thank you to Dr. Singh, Patima, Alok, and Sanjeev. And I think you can continue the discussion here out on the floor. Thank you very much, sir.